Welcome, welcome to New Hope Missionary Baptist Church's online Bible study. And we're so grateful that you could take time out of your busy schedule to join us on this Thursday evening. We come to you live every Thursday night um, with the uh, Bible study. And uh, we just started a fresh look at uh, a book by uh, Tom Rayner. And the book uh, is entitled The Post quarantine church. All right. And that's what we're going to be taking a deep look at today. The post quarantine church, six urgent challenges and opportunities. So we got started last week, taking a look at Tom Rayner's book, which is um, really going to become kind of like the document that churches and nonprofits are going to be looking at as they look to come out of this pandemic. Now, we need to be honest and clear that our churches are in different places. Everybody is not reopened. Uh, for example, New Hope is not yet totally open the building, but as we have been saying since day one, uh, the church is open, but the building is closed. And uh, we interpret that to mean that you and I are the church. And the church is not brick and mortar, but it is those band of baptized believers in Jesus Christ. So welcome aboard. If this is your first time joining us, we want to say thank you so much for uh, joining our Bible study. Now, let me give you some ground rules to help you with how we do things here. We do our Bible study, um, we kind of depend on you, uh, the listener, the viewer, to uh, chime in with your comments, to let us know uh, wh where you're at, you know, give us an amen, give us a like, give us a share us with some friends. Uh, but how we uh, react and how we relate to each other is we do that through the comment field. And you can find the comment field on whatever platform you're on. We happen to be on uh, Facebook and YouTube. And right below under this feed is a field where you can type in your comments. So we do give um, opportunity uh, by raising questions and trying to get uh, some dialogue where you will, if you want to, have room to uh, respond. Um, so thank you again for joining us. So let us get into it. OK, so here we go. Here we go. Uh, the book is the post quarantine church. And there it is up close in case you want to pick it up. It is a really, really uh, small book, but don't let its size fool you. It's a little bit over 100 pages and chock full of vital information for any church. So uh, you church leaders, uh, get a hold of it. Um, we're, we're pushing it everywhere we go, uh, the post-quarantine church, okay? And uh, today we're going to be talking about, uh, in the book, challenge number one. He lifts six challenges. We're going to look at the first challenge. And uh, challenge number one, uh, Tom Rayner talks about in the book is gather differently and better. That's the challenge. How do we gather differently and better? Okay, so that's our focus for tonight. Okay, so we do have a scripture to help us to uh, get started and get grounded in this passage, okay, in this particular study. Okay, so our scripture for tonight is from the book of Hebrews. Uh, chapter number 10, verses 24 through 25, okay? So we're glad to see you join us, and, uh, you know, we're hoping and praying that everything is well with you and your family, and everything is good at your house, okay? Now, here's the scripture. I'm going to make it larger because some of you may be on your cell phone, and here it is, okay? All right. And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, 
not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. Okay, that chapter 10 of Hebrews is a good chapter to read it, it, when you got some extra time. And I want you to think about from chapter 10 verses 22 to 25, uh, Paul writes about four things that he, he says, let us. And uh, this is one of the let us things that he says, let us consider how we can spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, okay? So uh, there's our scripture to help us ground our study for the night. And we're really gonna be talking about how to gather differently, okay? Now, my question for you, first question for the night, and uh, if you wanna comment, we certainly appreciate that, is, how were family gatherings different last year? How were family gatherings different last year? Okay, so yeah, there you go. Just right in the comment field. Um, I can tell you in, in my house, uh, gatherings were less frequent. Uh, the uh, you know, we, we kind of, uh, for the most part, my wife and I and, and, and my two daughters, we kind of all came together and, and cocooned and stayed, stayed close. We didn't have any uh, too many outside uh, uh, influences, other people coming over. So, uh, yeah, so how did, how did it go? Okay. Um, we couldn't. Okay. That's, that's, that's a, no, no gatherings. That's uh, isn't that something, you know. And when you got family, you're used to like at uh, birthdays, uh, Fourth of July, uh, Memorial Day, Labor Day, uh, you know, the big holidays. Uh, sometime during the summer, you know, we were used to as a people coming together, you know, sharing, uh, you know, t things together. So. Uh, Oh, here's an interesting, Michelle says the gatherings were virtual and we've seen a lot of that, right? We meet up with people on, uh, you know, FaceTime, on Skype, you know, or on Zoom calls. Uh, and, you know, we I kept my bubble real tight. We only met with a very few people, okay? Uh, Joanne Fair says Mother's Day, different, right? Okay. Wearing masks, okay. Uh, gatherings virtual, okay. So, you know, it's been different, hasn't it? Okay, I think most people will admit that this past year was different. You know, my, my uh, daughter, uh, uh, my oldest daughter has a birthday in May. And what was significant about it is uh, some of her friends came over from Philly. And, and their idea of coming over to celebrate her birthday with her were to come over in their car and drive by the house and, sh and wave and shout happy birthday. We, we, we convinced them to get out the car and they social distanced in the backyard. It was, it was, it was nothing like I'd ever seen before in my life. Okay. Um, you know, Everybody was careful not to touch anybody, had mask on. You know, it was, it was, you know, something out of a uh, sci-fi movie. Okay, so um, Betty Gilliard said only on Sunday, and that was just for some family members. Okay, basically, if you weren't in my bubble, <laughs> Brenda and I, we didn't get to see you at all. You know, we we just. We didn't, we didn't get to, we didn't get to do that. Okay. So family gatherings, very different last year. Okay. Now I'm going to warn you about some of the uh, content that I'm about to share with you. It may be disturbing. I have to give that warning out uh, front. So I'm going to give you a series of 
photographs and pictures. And I want you at the end to tell me what is the common feature. Okay, did you get that? I'm going to show you a series of photographs, of pictures, of clips. And I want you to tell me at the end what is the common feature. Okay, are you ready? Okay, so I'm gonna make the, I'm gonna make my screen big. Now I'm still here. I'm still here. You may not be able to see me, but I'm still here. Okay, I'm gonna put the picture up. I'm put the picture up for about two seconds each. I'm, you know, and and I want you at the end to tell me what all of these photographs have in common. Are you ready for that? Okay, here we go. Did you get it yet? If you get it, let me know. You can you can write it in the comment field. Oh yeah, I see it. You got it, right? How do we do? How do we do? All right. Did you do it? Okay. Okay. Michelle Carter says these are places where people gather. Okay. Elizabeth Jackson says things and places that we couldn't go. Okay. The Strina Clinton says social gatherings. Ah, the perceptive one. Cowell says no mask. Okay. Gatherings. All right. I'm going to go back over the list for you and I'm going to help you see this. Okay. All right. Y'all ready for this? Okay. So here we go. Some disturbing pictures. Okay. This picture is a picture of Lakewood Church, okay? Let me make it bigger, okay? That's Lakewood Church. Lakewood Church uh, in, in Texas, Houston, uh, seats 16,800 people. Over 50,000 people gather in Lakewood Church every week. Okay, that's po that's pre-pandemic. Now, during the pandemic, we don't know the numbers. Okay, all right. Here's another one. Okay, this really is a family or you know, group of people. If you look in their laps, you find that they have Bibles in their laps. Okay, all right. They're having church in the park. Aha. Uh -huh. This is a group in Texas. Um, I forget the name of the, the town. Let's see, I got some notes here. I'm trying to get my notes to come up. Uh, but this lady in white is the pastor. And she, one day she was riding around and she saw some couple people standing under a tree. So she decided to go over and talk to the people and have prayer. And she served in communion. And so she started a ministry at the church under the tree. And twice a month, she goes and she has people to meet her under the tree. There's a church. Okay. Stanley Funeral Home. Not necessarily Stanley, but funeral homes are becoming popular destinations to have church. Churches. Uh, there have been some funeral homes that have been converted to churches. And when uh, churches were not able to open, a lot of times 
uh, some of them went and simply moved their service over to the funeral home. This is a, a church uh, that is actually on top of a volcano, okay? It is built, um, you know, you, you can't miss it. it has a, a, what a scenic view, okay? Um, talk about uh, church, okay? So um, now this is a place where churches often meet, Starbucks, okay? Pre-pandemic, it was a favorite destination for Bible studies, for small groups, for life groups. They would meet over a cup of coffee, sit there and talk and have Bible study church right in Starbucks. Okay. This is a familiar place for churches to meet inside of high schools, inside of school auditoriums. Okay. Very popular place. Uh, even uh, in New York State and some other states during the pandemic, uh, people were able to meet in schools. Uh, this is a Newell uh, PA. This is a pastor who is actually at a drive in theater. You can see the screen behind him. Uh, he's on this scissor boom, this thing that lifts him up. And he's preaching, and the folk are in their cars. Okay, he turned the drive-in theater into a church. That's right, cruise ships. A lot of times, cruise ships have uh, churches that will rent out. You know, uh, book part of the cruise ship. Uh, some um, well-known uh, Christian artists and and. Uh, Broadcasters, they will rent ships and they'll have church all on the cruise ship, right? Amazing, okay? Um, Regal Cinema has had a program before pre-COVID where they would rent out their space on Sunday morning uh, to churches. And they would it was a win-win because the, the, the places weren't being used and uh, the churches needed space. And so they would rent out the auditorium, which was already made. It was already designed and people could sit in comfortable seating and, you know, and have service. They have an actual policy for renting out to churches. This, uh, the Ugly Coyote is actually a bar. But if you look at the um, tables, you'll find that this bar has been turned into a church. And finally, at home, on the couch, family watching church service. So there you see it. All of these unlikely places have become churches. Okay. Many of us, we only have a one mindset of what a church is, but church can be anywhere people gather. OK, thank you all for staying with me with that, because I know you're like, where in the world was he going with that one? OK, now here's a question uh, wherever you are. How many days a week was your church building used during the pandemic? I'm talking about your church building. How many days a week was your church building used? during the pandemic, okay? All right, you can put your response down. Okay, how many days a week was your church building used during the pandemic? Now we have people who are on uh, watching us from all over the country, okay? Um, okay. So we got a uh, responded that said their church building was used three days a week during the pandemic, okay? One, okay, all right. Any others? Zero. You know, the interesting, because the, these folk all go to the same church. We got one, two, three, zero. <laughs> So here we go. We got a one, 
we got a two, we got a three, and we got a zero. <laughs> all right, all right. So anybody else want to chime in? How many days a week was your church used during the pandemic? Because Tom Rayner makes a tremendous compelling argument about our churches, okay? All right, now, uh, okay, one, okay, oh, zero, okay. Now, let me tell you about uh, New Hope. We're in Jersey City. We're white opposite Manhattan. Um, our church building, and, and uh, let me clarify, I'm talking about the building. I'm talking about the sanctuary. I know I didn't say that up front, so yeah, throw the bricks at me. Go get me. But uh, our church uh, was really opened just one, once a week during the pandemic, and that was to give out food to the community, okay? And it was uh, our church uh, garage. We opened it up and made it into a makeshift food pantry, okay? And, but it was accessible once a week. Um, during the pandemic, we were, everything was done remotely. Uh, occasionally, you know, uh, recently we had our dances in the sanctuary, filming dance, but but uh, for 2020, uh, for the majority of the year, well, all of 2020, we did not go into the sanctuary after March uh, the 8th, okay? So there were that, that nine month period where we did not go in at all. And, and even in 2021, this year, uh, the praise dancers have been in, but uh, there hadn't been a service there. Uh, the uh, prayers, the sermons, all of those things are broadcast remotely, okay? At people's houses, at their homes, they, uh, they do all of that. So, um, so the, 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 the issue is that I'm trying to get you to see is that what the pandemic has done for us and our churches is it has created a new opportunity, okay? There are some folk who never thought that they would imagine the day when the churches were locked down and were not in use, okay? Now, because the church was not in use, we have another question to raise. And here is the question. How important is the building to the church? Think about it a minute. How important is the building to the church? All right, uh, Michelle says, uh, Ken Carter says, in my area, my church was only opened on Sundays and Wednesday. Okay, great, great. So the question is, how important is the building to the church? Now, most of us are savvy enough to know, and that's why I didn't spend a lot of time on it. But in case you don't know, I want to make it clear to you that the church is not a building. The building is where the church gathers. But as we found out, the church can gather in the park, the church can gather at the drive-in, church can gather at a bar, it can gather at, at, at a, uh, a food store, it can gather at a uh, Starbucks. The church is just a place, the building is just a place where it gathers. Uh, it is not the church, okay? So how important is the building, okay? Uh, we found out that it is not that important. That's a good point, okay? Uh, that was pre-COVID, okay? So, so I, I mean, I think what you're, you're talking about, uh, Mr. Carter, is that the church, it was open on Sunday and Wednesday. That was pre-COVID, but during COVID, uh, I imagine it wasn't open on Sunday and Wednesday. Okay, thank you. Uh, we found out that the building is important, but we are the church. Now, uh, bear with me a minute because this is what uh, Tom Rainer talks about. Because the church has now understood that it can survive 
that it can, in some cases, thrive outside of the building. We need to rethink what we do with the building. Okay? Because now the building we have discovered after over a year that we're not going to die. We're not going to cease to exist if we're not in the building. So now why, that, why not take that time and learn how to repurpose and use the building for the glory of God? Okay. That that's what uh, Rainer is is getting to, and so I want to raise this question. Okay, I'm going somewhere, so stay with me. Okay, uh, here's the question: What are some things churches do to show people that they are not welcome? Okay, what are some things churches do to show people they are not welcome? Now, the reason why we're bringing this up because we're at this, this wonderful place that God has brought us to where some of us have realized that our churches were not as important to what we do as we thought they were, okay? Now we've got to start changing our mindset and our thinking about how we viewed our buildings, how we viewed our spaces. You know, a lot of times you, I remember going to church a lot and I would go visit churches and the usher would get up and say, and they've even said this in New Hope, that our uh, doors hang on the hinges of welcome. We welcome you once. We welcome you twice. We welcome you three times in the name of Jesus Christ. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Then you know, they turn around, walk away, and they go back to being the same person they were before, okay? Now, what happens is a lot of our churches, unbeknownst to us, because we don't get to see it, have done things and acted in such a way till we say to people in a subtle way, you're not welcome. So how do, how do we do that? Well, I'm going to show you this. I hate to show you this, but this, this, I'm going to show you this. Uh, this is really disturbing. Okay. Okay. All right. Free pants required to enter service. <laughs> now I'm laughing. I'm laughing because I'm almost crying. Okay. Because uh, some of you who uh, have been at New Hope when I got there know that we didn't have this sign, but we had this mindset that come as you are, except that if you're a woman, you can't wear pants. <laughs> Hello, y'all remember that? We always said, no, Jesus looks on, you know, man look on out with the pants, but God looks on the heart. And then we say, well, you know what, we're looking too. And it was important to us that you had to come a certain way. You had to dress a certain way, okay? Now, understand culturally, you got people today who women wear pants as often as men, you know? It's not, not, that, they, I, not that they're necessarily trying to wear the pants. They just wear pants like men wear pants, okay? They wear them to work. They don't get to work and somebody tells them at work, you can't go to work because you got on pants. But then they come to the God who's supposed to be the God who loves and embraces everybody. And then they say, well, no, you can't come in here. Not here. No, 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 no. <laughs> Go put on proper clothing. And what did that do? That definitely said to some people who may not have had in their wardrobe uh, dresses or skirts. Okay. Hello. You know, people wear what they have, right? We tell them, come as you are, right? but don't come like that, okay? Another thing is, uh, you may have seen some of these signs, right? No food or drinks in the sanctuary, okay? We tell people in a real subtle way that our sanctuary, you can't, you better not bring nothing in there. <laughs> we gonna get the police on you. We gonna get the popo, they gonna get you. You better not bring any food. You sure enough better not bring anything to drink in the church okay but please come to church please come because we want you to come <laughs> okay here's another one 
this is an interesting one because this one is really uh, speaking to the culture that we're in right now. You know, this quarantine, this pandemic, this post pandemic. Here it is. OK, this sign says no food or drink. Pick up a bulletin. Keep physically distanced and follow the ushers. Stay in your seat. No singing. Use the washroom at the back of the sanctuary. Now, these are common sense suggestions, right? But a lot of times uh, they kind of suggest to people, you know, you got to follow our rules, okay? Can you imagine telling somebody uh, today, you know, stay seated, <laughs> don't sing? I mean, if we tell you, okay, uh, sit in your seat, don't sing, uh, stay physically. Some people may start concluding that is this really church? Or is this just something that, uh, you know, they try to make look like church? <laughs> okay. Uh, you know, so uh, here's, here's another one. <laughs> Go away. We really don't want you here. Only reason why we do this stuff is because Jesus said do it. But Jesus is not here right now. Right now, I'm the head usher. <laughs> you, and if you do come in, you got to sit in the back. Hello? Okay. So here's some things that other people said <laughs> uh, that we do to show people that they're not welcome. Uh, they put mean members as ushers. <laughs> uh, uh, Delicious Hobson says uh, they show no attention. Linda Jackson says no hospitality. They're not kind. Here's one. <laughs> Alonzo Berry Jr. says they make visitors stand and make a speech during the service. Now, that's one of my pet peeves because I'm a preacher. I'm a public speaker. And I know my heart palpitates when somebody asks me to stand up in an environment that I'm not used to. And I'm like, what? Oh, all we want to know, Reverend, is where you from? Uh, who your pastor is? Da, 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 da. Okay, I don't know none of y'all. <laughs> okay, okay. Uh, let, let Use church talk and language that only members can understand. You know, y'all know the church language, right? You know, uh, and then we... we use it so often that we can't understand why other people think that we are cult. <laughs> okay. Ah, uh, but here it is. I knew it was going to be up there. I knew it was coming, but the members will eat and drink in the church. Well, I think we've got to start rethinking church. That's what Tom Rainer talks about. If we're going to ask people to come to our churches, we can't keep putting our little rules up there and say, come, but you can only come when you do the way we want you to do. Just the way it is. People wonder why people don't come. And then when you look at the list of rules and some of our rules are written, but the most of our rules are not written. And then the ones that are on the wall, they're like, you can't go here. You can't go there. You got to be quiet. You can't, can't come in the sanctuary after a certain time. You're like, oh my goodness. And for all of that, people are like, you know what? I'll just stay home. Okay. Okay. Uh, she said, what church are you from? <laughs> you don't have and you don't have a church. How about that? Yeah, because the first thing the usher said, will you give us your name and your church home and your pastor? And people ain't been to New Hope in 30 years. Uh, 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 my pastor is Reverend Williams. <laughs> okay. Uh, and and so these are some of the things that we put up that we kind of say to people, look, uh, it may not be a good idea for you to come here, okay? Uh, he, here's a side that, 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 uh, that was on, on church parking lot. Church parking only, anytime. Violators will be told at the owner's expense. Can you imagine going to church and getting told? I mean, can you imagine going to church and getting your car towed for going to church because you parked in the pastor's spot, the deacon spot, the mother of the church spot. Oh my gosh, you could set off a world war. 
All right. Okay. All right. As Edith Dickey says, you know, asking people to get up and, and, and make that pronouncement about who they are, where they're from, everybody doesn't go to church. That's a great point. Okay. So just want you to think about that. Now, what if our churches thought of ways to bring the community in instead of keeping them out? You know, Tom Rayner talked about one church that was uh, trying to embrace the community and they wonder why the community people wouldn't come to their church. And Rayner uh, in his group, uh, Church Answer, they went in and they started uh, asking the pastor and the leadership about, you know, what it is you want to do. And they like, we friendly, we, you know, we want the community to come in. And so he happened to pass by a document that was laying out and asked, what was it? And it was the document for community use of the church. He said the document was 64 pages long. If it if you got a 64 page document to use your church, to use your uh your, your kitchen, to use your 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 sanctuary, you really are saying to people, don't even don't even apply. 64 pages, I mean, people can sign a mortgage, <laughs> you know? And so he said to the pastor, look. This is why people don't want to come because you're saying they can come and they look at all of this stuff and all these rules and regulations. And he said one church had a regulation that nobody could rent the church unless they had a member of the church who made the request for them. Okay. And the member of the church who made the request had to be at the function. Hmm. So. You want to have a birthday party, you want to have a shower, you want to have some. You you couldn't just rent the church. You had to get an insider to rent it for you. And then the insider had to be there the whole time. Oh, the subtle things we do. Okay. Now, now, along comes a pandemic and says to us, it's time to reset our perspective in this new era, okay? All right, I'm gonna suggest something that may be uh, an anathema to some of you, okay? Okay, here it is. I'm gonna suggest this. What if we ask the community how our church facilities could best serve them? You know, we have too long been saying as a church, if we build it, they'll come. And we built it. And the builder generation is the generation that's before me. I'm a boomer, but the, the builder generation is that generation was born between uh, 1926 and 1944, uh, um, somewhere around there. Uh, that generation built churches. You, you, you look in most communities, a lot of the churches that are still around the mainline denominational churches were built, you know, in the uh, 20s, 30s, 40s. You know, they, that was the that was the, the heyday for building churches. OK, and they built the church not with the community in mind, but with the members in mind. So church was uh, the place. Uh, for the members. So what if your church became a place for the community instead of just a place in the community? You see the play on words? What if the church became a place for the community instead of just a place that was in the community? Now, Tom Rayner makes this point, and I want to make it again, is that most of our churches were vacant during the pandemic. We survived. The church is still there. The pastor is still pastoring. The deacons are still praying. The church is still functioning. Okay. It was not open. It wasn't open to members and it wasn't open to community, but it's still there. Most churches before the pandemic were only open once or twice a week anyway. So what did they do with the other time that they had available? They locked it up. And so 
we keep talking about kids have nowhere to go. There are no community centers. There are no that in churches, most of them don't have mortgages. Most of them been paid for, burnt the mortgage 20, 30, 50 years ago. And they have the space and they have real estate and they have all this value and it's doing nothing. Okay. And so the pandemic comes along and what it does, it accelerates everything. It pushes everything on fast forward. Okay. So let's do, let's go here. Okay. Now, uh, how important has your church been to your community during the pandemic? Okay. I'm going to give you a minute to, to uh, think about that. I'll make it bigger so you can look at it if you're on your cell phone. How important has your church been to your community during the pandemic? How important has your church been to your community during the pandemic? You know, I was saying this way, way before the, the pandemic ever happened. If your church was to suddenly disappear, would your community know it? And guess what happened? We disappeared. So we got one very important. Okay. That's anybody else. How important has your church been to your community during the pandemic? Okay. Think about it. All right. So here we go. How we doing? Anybody? Yeah. You know, one of the things that I, I found out about this book, uh, while I thought it is helpful and, and, and it's a valuable resource, it also makes me ask some tough questions. Okay. Very important. We have Bible study three times a week and services on Sunday. Okay. All right. That's uh, Delisha, right? Delisha Hobson says, a new hope. Good to me watching. Okay. Okay. All right. You know, one of the things about uh, the pandemic is that many of our churches experience a great influx of people when we shut the door. Think about it. When we stopped going inside the building, people started noticing us. I, I, I mean, I, wrap your head around that, okay? The church closes its doors, and now all of a sudden people recognize there is a church. It could be that when our doors were open, they were closed to the community. Now that our doors are closed, many of our churches have become open to the community. Okay? All right. Very good because we're still serving the community. Okay? We got to call more involvement. Okay? All right. So that's the question we need to think about. Okay? Now, I'm going to talk about three thoughts that... Um, Tom Rayner raises at the end of uh, this first uh, question or this first challenge. And the challenge was for us was gather differently and better. So here's the first thought, okay? Think of one innovative way your church could use its facilities, perhaps something that has never been done before. You know, what one church did, um, this is coming out of COVID, okay? Church realized that it was dying, that it was disconnected from the community. So what the church did, uh, they started looking at the people who were around the community and realized that the people had needs. So what this particular church did was went out and brought uh, several washing machines and dryers, hooked them up in their uh, um, basement area, and open them up to the community for people to come in and wash and dry their clothes free. 
Another church, what they did was they offered a uh, parents' night out 40, day, 40 uh, days during the year. So uh, like on a Friday night, they would offer to take care of kids while the parents could take time out to be with each other, okay? Churches thought of things that were like unusual that they could do in the community simply by seeing what the needs are. Um, so I want you to think about it. Think of one innovative way your church could use its building, its facilities, maybe something that has never been done before. So just take a moment and think about how could your church use its great asset and understand it should not be a problem because guess what? It hasn't been being used. The church hasn't used it and the church realized that it could get along with it or without it. Okay? So what one innovative way your church could use its facilities? Perhaps something that has never been done before. I want, I want to hear your response to that. What do you think you could, your church could do with its building that it hadn't done before? Maybe it could help its community. You know, people always need places to meet. People always need, you know, um, there's a... Um, thing here I wanted to show you. Uh, a lot of churches are going to two or more churches in one location. Uh, people are finding out during the pandemic that there are a lot of churches that were small looking for places to worship. And churches realize we got all this space that we're not doing anything with. We don't have a mortgage. We don't need to pay rent, <laughs> you know? And uh, so they had... Uh, partnered with churches and said, okay, you can use our space. You know, it's we all serve in the same uh, Christ. <laughs> okay. Anybody come up with a, um, an idea, an innovative way your church could use this facility? Perhaps something that's never been done before? I know you're thinking about that, okay? Let me go on to the uh, another point, okay? Ah, that's awesome. Thank you. Uh, Joanne Fair says to teach adults in the community a new skill, skill to find new employment. You know, that is how we're going to have to learn to partner with our communities. We're going to have to be the place that brings it to where they can get it. Okay. I was just talking to Dr. Tyler today about uh, seeing if we can't help people get, uh, you know, who who maybe went to school and didn't finish an associate's degree, but wanted to go on and complete a bachelor's degree, find ways that we can partner with the university to bring that right there to where they would have went to go to Bible study. And they can take that night and go to school and wind up at the, you know, 18 months or so with a degree get a better job, change the trajectory of their life, change their life for not only themselves, but change it for their children. Why? Because we got space. And what has the space been doing? It's been vacant. What are some other things? Okay. All right. So we got to start thinking outside the box. All right. Uh, people are not going to come to us. We've got to go to where they are. Okay. All right. Uh, Elizabeth Jackson, use for daycare for the parents that go back to work. You know what? So Jackson, I'm going to tell you this. Maybe I shouldn't let the cat out the bag, but look, goodness gracious. Where did you come up with that idea? Because you must have been reading my notes and eating my lunch. You know, one of the things that uh, the uh, stimulus package has recognized that uh, the first couple stimulus packages did not take into consideration the impact of having children and daycare. You know, some people were working 
and uh, paying for daycare. And at the end of the day, they were about net zero. They weren't even bringing home enough money to take care of their family because it was going to the child care providers. And so churches are excellent places to open up their facility and say, here, maybe you don't want to go through the process. Maybe you can get somebody who has a license and say, here, come use my space. Let them create another revenue stream. Let them pay you to use your space. We got to start thinking about stuff. Those are needs that we can meet, okay? I'm helping people get their GED, okay? All right? All right. Awesome. Okay? Now, I'm a, uh, point number two, uh, thought number two that uh, um, he, he uh, wants us to think about is this. Think of alternative days and times when your church could gather for worship services. Think creatively to reach people you're not currently reaching. You know, churches meet on Sunday at 11 o'clock a.m. I'm going to tell you something about 11 o'clock a.m., okay? They were meeting at 11 o'clock a.m. before I was born. Do you know why churches meet at 11 a.m.? Churches meet at 11 a.m. because our nation was mainly, 100 years ago, an agrarian economy. What does that mean? Meaning that people were predominantly farmers. They worked on farms. They worked plantations. They worked in fields. So what would happen is, uh, the uh, cow had to be milked, the chicken had to be fed, uh, the wood had to be split, all those things, all those chores in the morning had to be taken care of before you could go to church. So church would not happen at 6 a.m. because that's when people are getting up already out taking care of their chores. And it wasn't until 10, 11, 12, 11 o'clock or so that people actually were able to come in, get dressed up, and then go out to the church. So 11 o'clock was the established time for farmers to go to church. How many farmers do we have on this uh, uh, Bible study tonight? How many of y'all milked a cow this morning? Okay, it just doesn't happen. We are no longer agrarian, okay? We, we, we have moved way past that. We, we are now in the digital age. Guess what? One third of your population and my population, your town and my town, one third of the people work on Sunday morning around 11 o'clock. How do we know that? When, when we broadcast at 11 a.m., we know exactly how many people are online watching us. We have a ticker that tells us how many people are online. What we also know because of the metrics with uh, uh, YouTube and Facebook, that we have more people who watch us after 11 o'clock than watch us when we're on live because people work, because people have other things to do. And what the pandemic has done, it has freed us up to look at our time differently. As a result, we decided at New Hope that we could have a Bible study on Monday night. We could have a Bible study on Wednesday at noon. We could have a Bible study on Thursday because people are available at different times. Did you see that? Okay, so think of alternative days and times when your church could gather for worship services. Some churches are figuring that uh, after the pandemic, maybe when they met, it didn't make sense. Maybe they need to change the time, you know? Um, that's a conversation that folk need to have, okay? 
uh, to, to reach more people, uh, to reach a different audience, okay? And the third and final thought that he raises is this. Think of ways your church could possibly partner with the local government or schools to use your facilities, okay? One of the biggest problems we have in our town is, uh, you know, with our school system, uh, our buildings, you know, uh, they, they're overcrowded, they, they're not uh, up to a, a standards they need to be at. Uh, and, and churches, you go up and down the main thoroughfares of our city, all you see every day during those hours when, when, when kids are in school and the latchkey hours between 3 and 6 p.m., what do you see? Empty, locked churches. Okay? They're not doing anything. They're not reaching the community. Community's not going there. And so now, what Rainer says, we need to think of ways that the church could possibly partner with the local government or the schools to use our facilities. You know, a lot of ch churches partner with the schools to use the schools, but what about churches becoming daycare or becoming after school places to help with, you know, making sure that our kids are uh, cared for and safe after school? And guess what? There's a lot of grant money. There's a lot of resources now because even the federal government is realizing that they don't have the answers. Okay. A kind of uh, upward basketball or soccer leagues. I mean, th these are things that churches can do if they want to gather better and differently. Okay. So that's that. So, so, uh, what we're going to do now at our next session, uh, we're going to look at the second challenge, okay? And our second challenge is going to be uh, how do we seize the opportunity to reach the digital world, okay? That's what we're going to be talking about when we meet next time. How we going to reach the digital world? So I want to ask you, do you have any questions? Do you have any comments? That Has this provoked any thoughts in you? You got any ideas? Because uh, anybody now who comes back and say that we can't use the church for X, Y, Z, you got to ask them, well, what have we used it for in the last year? Nothing. <laughs> Absolutely nothing. We didn't have your choir rehearsal. We didn't have your missionary meeting. We didn't have our church conference. We didn't have Bible study. We had nothing, nothing, nothing in the church. And the building's been paid for. It's there. It's the biggest thing in the community. The community is crying that it needs services. It needs help. And guess what? If we want the community to come to us, we have got to figure out how best to meet the needs of our communities. Does that help you? Okay. Uh, Kendall Carter says, during my formative years, the church, the, the support, the Boy Scout troops, those are things that churches have been uh, known for. I know when I was in the Boy Scouts growing up, uh, th there was a, a church, St. Augustine, that, that had, a, had the Boy Scout Troop 44, Asbury Park. Yeah, we... We were there, but it was a local church that sponsored the boys club. And me and my brothers, we were members of that uh, Troop 44 in Asbury Park. And I'll never forget the, the values and the things I've learned. And and it, it was it was a church that opened the doors, you know, and I ain't gonna tell you how many years ago that was, but that was, that was a long time ago, okay? But, uh, you know, we have in the past a New Hope, uh, open our doors to AA, you know, to, to, to different groups, to, to uh, uh, sororities and fraternities, you know, groups in our community who wanted space to meet, you know, and here it is. You got to ask that. That's been paid for. 
and you talk to most churches, most churches have burnt their mortgage a long time ago. So they got this asset and they crying about having money. And, and then here you got this opportunity to say, okay, what does our community need? And we know coming out of COVID, out of this pandemic, a lot of people are going to need care. They're going to need, uh, you know, uh, wellness uh, places. They're going to need places for uh, their children to be cared for. They're going to need uh, service that, that services that can be brought to them. And if not brought to their house, at least brought to their neighborhood where they can access them. And we already have the spot. And that was one of the more valuable things that I learned out of this first challenge, how to gather better, uh, you know, uh, and, and that's what we need to do. We need to learn how we're going to gather, not just return, but we need to return differently and we need to return better. OK. All right. So uh, I hear uh, uh, Mr. Carter said they got tornado warning. So we're going to pray God keep you all safe down there. Uh, uh, having two parking lots and no parking in that area, let them park. Okay. Those are great ideas. You know, we've got to learn how to partner with the community and the more we do it, you know, one of the things, uh, the first lady she's on, uh, and, and, you know, every Tuesday we give out, uh, food groceries to, uh, 50 families. Okay. And, to you cannot imagine how impactful that is. You know, people come every week. They are grateful. They are thankful, you know, and they they need, they depend on the resources that we provide for them. OK. And, uh, you know, the pandemic, pre-pandemic, we weren't giving out anything. And we would say to them, if you want to eat, come in our soup kitchen. But now. The pandemic has forced us to close our soup kitchen and we open up a pantry and people are saying, hey, thank you. Thank you. That's just one need. Think about all the other things that God calls us to do that you and I could get, become partners in. OK, so look, if you have a prayer request, if you have a comment, a question, and maybe this has generated some thinking in your mind. What would you want your church to be like when it comes out of the quarantine? What are some things that we could leverage our facilities to do? OK, um, you know, one of the things that we have to realize as a people, churches, our churches have always been central to our communities. If it didn't come out of church, if it wasn't voiced from the pulpit, many of us didn't listen to it and we didn't heed it. OK, now. Coming out of this pandemic, we have this wonderful opportunity to reimagine what could we do with a space that we haven't had need of in over a year. Just thinking. <laughs> OK, so got a prayer request. Uh, raise it and uh, we're going to get ready to close with a word of prayer. So will you join me? Uh, as we get ready to go to God in prayer. OK, let's do that. OK. OK, so um, let me do this. So whatever you're going through, wherever you are, I want to first of all remind you that you're not in this by yourself. The wonderful thing is that God has so ordained that we could come together on a night like tonight from our various homes, from our workplaces, from our cars, wherever we happen to be. And our coming together constitutes us being the church. We don't need brick and mortar. We, we, we are the church. And God has kept us. And so tonight, I'm going to be praying for you, whatever you're going through, whatever you are up against, whatever barriers are in your life, whatever difficulties that you are facing. I'm praying that God would be with you, 
open the doors that you need open, close the doors that you need closed, that he would be your doctor, that he would be your healer and your deliverer, that he would be the one who stands in the gap for you. Will you pray with me? Lord, thank you for this day. Thank you for the time that you've given us that we can look at your word and look at what the Apostle Paul tells us that we shouldn't forsake the assembling of ourselves together. But thank you that we could come together even in a digital format, even in the places where we are, that you, God, in your great wisdom has created all of this technology. Now we come to redeem it. We come to use it for your glory and for your benefit. Thank you that we as the church, you've called us to go into Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the utmost parts of the world. I ask now that you would bless us. Help us to be lights in our communities. Help us to be willing to share what you've given us. The buildings that have laid dormant and empty and vacant for so long. Now, God, as we see some light at the end of the tunnel, as we get hopeful about the possibility of going back in, help us, God, to go in with a new mindset that we all are your creation. So I pray for that mother who struggles with child care. I pray for that person who hasn't been to a doctor but needs to see one. I pray that for, for the person who is having financial difficulty and would need to learn how to manage and take care of their resources. And I thank you, Jesus, that you've given us the ability to meet those needs. Now, God, for the person who is sick, I pray for healing. For the person who's bewildered and Lord, just tired, just been through too much, too long. Would you speak peace to their soul? For that child who's having a difficulty learning and keeping pace, open their understanding. Give them wisdom that only comes from above. Now, God, go with us and stand by us is my prayer. Hold us and Keep us in your hand. And I ask all of these blessings in the strong, mighty, and majestic name of Jesus the Christ, I pray. Amen. God bless you, my brothers and my sisters. I want you to hang on in there. I want you to be encouraged. You know, uh, weeping may last for a night, but joy, I'm talking about real joy, comes in the morning. You just hang on in there. The morning light will appear. Thank God because our God is able to do exceedingly and abundantly above anything that we could ever think or ask. May God bless you. Amen.